So our next speaker is Natasha Block. She has been a scientist of the world. So she got her bachelor's from the University of the Andes in Colombia, her master's at the University of Paris, her PhD at University of Chicago, and she's currently a Marie Curie postdoctoral fellow at University College London. But luckily for us, she was visiting Chicago, so we could get her here without too much trouble. Um, she works on the evolution of color and color perception. And she, one of her uh, greatest uh, honors was that she won um, the best dissertation in biological sciences at the University of Chicago. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction. And I'm really happy and honored to be part of the symposium on color evolution. And um, my research is relevant to the symposium because I think we can all agree that the evolution of colors is undeniably linked to the way they're perceived. Um, and to show you how amazing color vision is and to give you a little bit of a feeling of how it works, I decided to start with a, a visual exercise. Um, I hope it works for everyone in the room, but what I need you to do is focus on that white spot in the middle of the screen. And if you really focus on it while uh, you do this, half of your visual system is gonna be exposed to green and the other half is gonna be exposed to red. Um, and while you do this, both parts of your visual system are gonna become what we call adapted to different colors. And if you've been really good and you focused on that spot, hopefully when I switch to these images, you're gonna perceive them as having very different colors. Um, but if you wait or if you simply look away, um, I hope it worked for most people. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you saw from the start that it's just identical images. Um, but uh, what I wanted to illustrate with this illusion is that the way that we perceive colors doesn't only depend on the physical properties of objects, but also on the perceptual biases that come from the way that our visual systems are wired. So potentially different species that have different visual systems could potentially perceive color in completely different way. And this could have really deep impacts into um, uh, color evolution. So if we wanna understand the evolution of color in nature, we should start by understanding the genetic basis of color traits and the mechanisms of color production, as well as the selective pressures that drive colors themselves. But also we need to consider how these colors are perceived and particularly in the context of mating by studying mating preferences for those colors. So with my research, I focus on um, studying color evolution from the perspective of the receiver by studying color perception and color preferences for color. Um, and I'm gonna start uh, by telling you a little bit about my PhD research on obscene evolution as in, in New World Warblers. Um, New World Warblers are brightly colored birds that occur in North and South America. And for my PhD, I, talk a, I took a broad comparative approach using 15 species of New World Warblers that I chose not only because they differ in color, but also in the degree of plumage dimorphism. We have some species like the black-throated blue warbler on the top where males and females look completely different, and species like the overbird all the way down here in the bottom that are completely monomorphic and both sexes look exactly the same. Before I move on to tell you about uh, what I found about their obscens, let me give you a really brief introduction of what obscens are and how they function. Uh, so opsins are the proteins in the back of the eye that are responsible for photon capture. So this is the first step that starts vision. Um, and some opsins are um, involved in color vision and some others are involved in um, color processes independent of color, but for today we're just gonna focus on our color opsins. Um, in the case of birds, they have four of these opsins, so they're called tetrachromats. Um, Four of these opsins peak in what we call the visible spectrum, which is what Molly uh, also talked about, and is just a part of the spectrum that humans are, are uh, sensitive to. So they have a, an opsin sensitive to long wavelengths, to middle wavelength light. This thing doesn't work. Let me just use, is this better? So they have an opsin sensitive to long wavelength light, one middle wavelength, and uh, one in uh, sensitive to short wavelength light. And they have a fourth option that peaks in the UV and makes them sensitive to this wavelengths of light that humans um, cannot perceive. Opsins are defined by their uh, wavelengths of maximum sensitivity that we call lambda max. And uh, there's a large body of research uh, together with my own showing that across birds, 
Lambda Max evolves very slowly. This is actually the reason that um, spectral tuning in birds wasn't studied for a really long time. We could see all across the literature that uh, opsin spectral tuning didn't change in birds and this, they were extremely conserved. Um, but um, opsin expression, on the other hand, is something that I became really interested in because gene expression in general has the potential to evolve a lot faster than protein function. It has been shown to have a, a large impact in phenotypic evolution, and it can also drive to interesting differences between sexes, so to sexual dimorphism. So for my PhD research, I focused on, um, um, in addition to uh, what Molly talked about, and I'm really happy she did because this is something that I'm not gonna talk about <laughs> for <laughs> time reasons, so I'm really happy you brought it up. I showed that, um, that these opsins in warblers as well evolve very slowly and, they, um, and if you look at patterns across birds, uh, it's related to the light environment. But I also became really interested in looking at opsin evolution um, and today I'm just gonna focus on what I found for the SWS2 opsin, which is the one sensitive to um, blue light, if you wish. Um, this is what I found, I looked at SWS2 opsin expression in this 15 species of New World Warblers. Um, I use at least two males and two females for each species. Um, in this graph, you're gonna see the expression in females against males, and this is the data. In, each gra in this graph, each dot corresponds to a different species. And what you can see at a glance is that SWS2 expression is actually quite variable across warbler species, and also that the ratio of female to male expression seems to vary quite a bit as well. Um, so I assessed the significance of these uh, differences using an ANOVA and I found that differences across species as well as between sexes are highly significant, as well as the interaction term, which in this case um, refers to the degree of sex bias in SWS2 expression across species. This uh, can be better visualized in this graph. Here, um, each bar corresponds to a different species so we have red bars for species in which SWS2 expression is higher in females than in males, so it's something that we refer to as female biased expression. Blue bars indicate species with male biased expression, and the black bars are species where um, expression is not considered sex biased. So after I found these differences and this, um, um, in both in the expression and in the degree of sex bias, I wanted to investigate why those differences might arise, particularly in the context of color evolution. So I looked at how SWS2 expression changes in species that have different degrees of sexual dimorphism in plumage as a proxy for the strength of sexual selection um, in each species. Here I'm gonna present the results separately for female expression and male expression against um, the degree of sexual dimorphism in plumage we have completely monomorphic species on the left, yeah, the left of the graph, and, um, and the most dimorphic species like this black-throated blue warbler on the right of each graph. And what I found is a strong, significant, positive relationship between SWS2 expression in females and the degree of sexual dimorphism in warbler species. This is a relationship that was completely absent in males, and if we consider that, um, plumage dimorphism has been shown to mainly evolve because of divergence in male plumage, it looks like what we're seeing here is a correlation between an aspect of the female visual system and the corresponding divergence in male plumage. However, we know that sexual dimorphism is known to vary in species that forage at different heights, so in the ground of the forest versus the canopy because of the light conditions are very different. So I tested uh, whether the relationship that I'm seeing between um, SWS2 expression and sexual dimorphism was actually mediated by some environmental correlation with foraging heights. But when I looked at the association between SWS2 expression in both males and females with foraging height, I found that they're actually not, um, that they're not related, so SWS2 expression doesn't change in species that forage at different heights of the forest. So it looks like what we're seeing here matches the prediction of classical models in sexual selection and mate choice where we have an aspect of the visual system of females that could potentially 
uh, modulate female preference that correlates or co-evolves with the corresponding male nuptial trait, um, which in this case is plumage, is um, male plumage, um, and it does so independent of the environment. Now, everything I've talked about so far was um, relates to obscen expression, but obscens, as I said, are only the first step that initiates vision, and they're a small component of the complete visual pathway. And there are a lot of components higher up in the brain that can also modulate color and color preferences. So for my uh, postdoc research, I moved on to study how color preferences are um, encoded in, like beyond the retina in the brain of guppies. And now I'm going to tell you about the project that I'm, gonna, I'm working on right now on the neurogenomics of female preferences for color. Um, I'm sure in this audience many people are familiar with guppies. Um, this is a system that has uh, called a lot of attention because of the great colors males have. They're also really variable in color. And what makes it really fascinating for me is that male color and female preferences are correlated across populations. So that in populations where males are not very colorful, females don't show a strong preference for colorful males. But in populations where males have evolved to be very colorful, we see females that strongly prefer colorful males. And I've had the opportunity to study these differences in female preference in the lab, together with our collaborators, Nicolas Colm and Alberto Corral at the University of Stockholm. So what they did is they brought these brightly colored uh, guppies into the lab, and they established two types of selection lines based on relative brain size. And what I'm showing in this graph is that in only three generations of selecting the guppies with the biggest brains and the smallest brains, they achieved close to 14% uh, differences in relative brain size across the lines. Um, so now, on, from now on, I'm going to refer to those lines as the large brain lines and the small brain lines. Um, and after doing extensive research on these um, on these selection lines, Nicholas and um, his lab members showed that they actually they also differ quite dramatically in their cognitive abilities. Uh, so to put it less diplomatically, small brain line fish are just not very smart. Um, we also showed that um, female preferences vary in these lines. So we, we found that large brain females have maintained this preference for colorful males that we see in the wild type females, but the small brain females have completely lost this preference. So they just look at males of different qualities and don't show any particular preference to mate with either type. The next thing we wanted to know is whether these differences in female preference reflect changes in the way they perceive color. So if it's that uh, these females don't have a preference because they uh, perceive color in a different way, or if it's, on the other hand, differences in higher order mechanisms that encode for this difference in, prefer in preference phenotypes. Um, so the first thing we tested was their um, optomotor response. And this is simply a test that takes advantage of the fact that fish follow color bands as they go around their tank. So what we can do is change the color of those color um, of those bands until the fish stop following them, at which point we infer that they just don't see them anymore. So you test this response at very different wavelengths for those bands. And when we did this across males and females in the different lines, we found that there is no significant difference in the optomotor response for e like males or females in the different lines. We went a step further and we measured obstin expression in males and females for the different lines. And we found that just for like the optomotor response, there is no difference in obstin expression across the lines. So from these tests, we can infer that the differences we see in the preference phenotype are not due to the fact that these fish are perceiving color any different, but is rather something more complex higher up in the brain. And this uh, became a great opportunity for me to study the mechanisms and the genetics of female preference because we have, in summary, a system that uh, replicates the variation in female preference we see in the wild. Uh, we can explore the relationship between cognition and female preferences a little bit, which is something that's starting to come up um, in the literature. And also, uh, we can do all of this while controlling for the genetic background, which is impossible if you go out in the field and look at females that have a different uh, preference phenotype. 
So we designed an experiment. Uh, from now on, I'm going to refer to um, the large brain and wild type lines as preference lines because females in these lines have strong preference for colorful male. And uh, to the uh, I'm going to call the non-preference line, um, the small brain lines, non-preference lines. And in each of these lines, we performed three types of behavioral treatment. In the first one, females were um, females were exposed to a colorful, attractive male. The second one, they were exposed to a dull or non-attractive male. And in the final treatment that worked as a control for general social interactions, we exposed females to another female. We led this behavioral trial, oh, sorry, we had, um, for each of these treatments, we had three replicate pools that were made of five females each. Um, and we let these behavioral trials run for 10 minutes, and we used RNA-seq to sequence the transcriptome of two different components of the brain um, that are involved in the visual pathway, of course. Um, the first one is the optic cecum, which is in charge of sensory processing of that visual signal that comes from the eye. And the second one is the telencephalon, which is the brain component that's in charge of decision. Now, the really novel thing about our experiment is that we only let those behavioral trials run for 10 minutes before we dissected the brain of females. And we did this despite of the challenges that this uh, carried when we were analyzing the data, because we wanted to get to those genes that are first activated when a female is evaluating a male. So hopefully those heads of the regulatory pathways that control female preferences. And we had several goals. The first one was to identify those preference genes by comparing the response of a female that is looking at an attractive male versus females that are looking at a dull male that doesn't match their preference. But we wanted to go beyond this and understand how this response evolved by comparing the response in females that have a preference versus females that don't have a preference. Uh, we were particularly interested in knowing if these differences in, in, in preference phenotype are carried because of differential regulation of the same genes, or if on the other hand, females that have a preference for colorful males and females that don't just mount a completely different response when they're looking at males of different qualities. We also wanted to try and explore the relationship between, oh sorry, uh, between cognition and, uh, rel and female preferences a little bit. And finally, we wanted to understand the spatial dynamics of the female preference response a little better by comparing the transcriptome into different components of the brain. And here are the first results. Um, so to identify those, the, what we're gonna call preference genes, which are um, differentially expressed when a female is evaluating um, an attractive male versus a dull male, we identified all the genes differentially expressed between the attractive treatment and the dull treatment, but we only kept those highlighted in this orange section here, which are the ones that are also differentially expressed when comparing the attractive and the female treatments, but not between the dull and the female treatments, because we wanted to only keep those genes that are associated when looking at an attractive male that matches the preference for a female. And what we found are, uh, we found 193 of those differentially expressed genes in the optic cecum and 106 in the telencephalon. We found that only eight of those genes are actually differentially expressed in both tissues. And from now on, um, because it's a little bit less of a mouthful, I'm gonna refer to these genes as preference genes. To examine or to show you the patterns of expression for these preference genes uh, in more detail, um, I'm gonna show you a heat map. Um, for those of you that are not very familiar with this type of figure, each line corresponds to each of those 193 Gs that are differentially expressed, and each column is a different sample, with the color on top of a column here indicates the line and the treatment for each sample. So all the samples that I'm showing you here correspond to preference females that were exposed to an attractive male. Um, and the first thing you can see is that some of these preference genes are upregulated in females that look at an attractive male, and some other genes are, um, on the other hand, downregulated in females that were exposed to an attractive male. But when I show you the rest of the heat map, what you see also is that all these samples for preference females exposed to an attractive male cluster together, meaning that they have a distinct pattern of expression for those preference genes compared to all of the other samples. And the second cluster that groups together all the preference females that were exposed to either a dull male or a female and all the non-preference samples 
cluster together in this in this separate group and they have a pattern of, in, of expression that's close to opposite to what we see in the, in the females exposed to an attractive male. If I show you a similar uh, heat map for the telencephalon, you see we have a um, similar pattern where um, all the preference female samples exposed to an attractive male cluster together, but in the rest of the heat map we see a completely different picture. Here we have two other clusters, one for the rest of the preference um, line samples, where uh, preference genes have a pattern of expression that's close to opposite to what we see in preference females exposed to an attractive male. But once we look at this third cluster that groups together all the non-preference samples, we see that the expression of preference genes is not changing at all. So the take home message from both these heat maps is that when we are looking at the expression of preference genes in non-preference females in the opticum, which is in charge of sensory processing, we see a signal that the, these preference genes are changing in their expression. So not females without a preference are actually seeing these males as being different. They're perceiving something is going on in terms of perception. But once the signal moves on to the decision-making component of the brain, non-preference females have completely lost differences in expression for preference, uh, for these preference genes. So it looks like this is the basis for the difference in uh, phenotype that we're seeing across the line. The next thing we did was um, do a similar kind of analysis for non-preference females to identify genes that were differentially expressed in females without a preference. And we found 61 uh, such genes in the opticum and 38 in the telencephalon. Um, so not only we found less genes being differentially expressed, but also none of these genes were shared with the preference lines. So it doesn't look like the difference in preference phenotype is due to differential expression of the same genes, but rather that when females with and without preferences are examining males of different qualities, they're mounting a completely different response. Um, next, we looked at how we analyze these preference genes in the context of co-expression networks. Um, co-expression networks are simply a way to visualize and to study the relationships between genes in terms of their expression. For those of you that work in ecologies, this is a very similar uh, methodology to interaction networks for populations. Um, and among its many advantages, um, we can see uh, co-expression networks allows us to identify those genes that are connected to a lot of other genes that have a strong regulatory connections to other genes. So they're called um, hub genes or the heads of the regulatory pathways in the network. Um, I, here I'm just gonna give you a teaser of what we found, but I'll be happy to give you more details later if you have any questions. Uh, what we found is that preference genes in the opticum and the telencephalon had completely different properties. So in the optic tecum, we found that preference genes were found at all levels in the network. Some of these genes were peripheral and some others have the properties of hub genes that are regulating the expression of many other genes. In the telencephalon, however, all the genes that we found to be differentially expressed are highly central and very connected according to multiple measures of centrality and connectivity within the network. So, all of these genes in the telencephalon have the properties of what we call hop genes, and they're exactly what we would expect in a decision-making component of the brain for those genes that are gonna start the response that leads to a mating decision after a female was evaluating a male. Um, the next thing we did was try to move on beyond those genes that are only um, involved in mating context so in uh, the two treatments where we had an attractive male and a dull male, but we tried to look for genes that were modulating social interactions in general in all guppies independent of their preference phenotype. So here what we did was consider all the differentially expressed genes um, in all the three pairwise comparisons between treatments, and we only kept those that were differentially expressed in both preference and non-preference females. We found 357 of these social genes in the opticum and 161 in the telencephalon. And we looked at the patterns of their expression a little bit uh, in more detail using a principal component analysis. So here I'm gonna show you the results for that using the same color scheme that we saw for, that I used for the heat maps before. 
Um, and what we found is for the optic cecum, the expression of social genes in um, females of both lines that were exposed to adult males, so it's this red and gray right here, are mostly overlapping, so we see no difference um, in, in, in females of both uh, preference lines um, when they're looking at adult males. On the other hand, the expression becomes distinct for preference females exposed to an attractive male and the non-preference females exposed to an, um, an attractive male. And this, we saw the same patterns when looking at, at the first three PCs. In the telencephalon, once more, we see a completely different pattern. If we focus on this graph right here, uh, where um, we have PC1 against PC2, the first thing that I found fascinating is that we find completely non-overlapping expression for all the different sample categories. So it looks like in the telencephalon, these um, social genes have a distinct pattern of expression for each social context in each of the um, line types that I used. And if we focus in particular on PC1, it's an axis of variation that separates samples by line. And considering that this is the brain component in charge of decision where cognitive ability would be expected to have the most impact, we think that this is actually an axis of variation that reflects differences in cognitive ability. And we're getting really interested in this and this is something that we're gonna try and explore a little more. Um, then if we look at the next graph, the last graph right here, which is uh, PC2 against PC3, we see that once again, um, the preference females that were exposed to adult male, their expression for social genes collapses um, on top of the, all the other samples exposed to a male, and only the expression of those um, of preference females exposed to an attractive male remains distinct. So it looks like both in the optic cecum and the telencephalon, something unique is happening for these social genes in terms of social um, gene expression. And what, um, so basically these are genes that are um, changing in their expression level in the different social contexts. And we found that many transcription factors among these social genes are actually known to regulate genes that we found amongst those preference genes. So it could very well be that changes in expression of those transcription factors are going to lead to the appropriate transcription or response in the different social contexts um, that we uh, looked at in our experiment. And so to finish, um, I've shown you how uh, we can study color perception and color preference and how this can impact color evolution. Um, and um, We've only, like there's very little we know about this aspect. We know very little about how color perception changes in a lot of terrestrial organisms and even in fish, there's a, so much more to be done. And when it comes to color preferences and, and the mechanisms that control female preferences, we know even less. So we've only started to scratch the surface on, on our knowledge of how these uh, color perception and color preferences are encoded. And hopefully as we keep gaining knowledge on these factors, we'll get a step closer to understanding the diversity of color in nature. And with that, I would like to thank my amazing advisors, both PhD and uh, postdoc, um, as well as um, my collaborators for the Austin project at the University of Toronto and for the preference stuff at um, Stockholm University. Um, and special thanks to Clara Lacey who did all the illustrations you saw in this talk and, and on the poster <laughs> for the symposium and uh, sources of funding. And last but not least, thank you to all of you for listening. <laughs>
So if I understood your question, you were wondering whether it, it would be possible in the wild to maintain these differences in expression despite the predation pressures, for example, on, on colorful males. Exactly, so like if you had an event where for, for a time there's increased predation of handsome males, so there aren't any brightly colored males for the females to respond to, wouldn't these preferences for handsome males just sort of degrade over time since there's no signal to respond to? Or are such things fairly well conserved in such events? So what we see in guppies is that, um, um, I mean, as you said, the differences in, in male color across population are driven by differences in predation. So these males only become colorful in, in populations that were uh, predators have not colonized. Um, and in, in those populations where males are not colored, we don't see um, that females have preferences. So in terms of, of the, let's say, the, the genetic changes that make that preference be gained or lost, absolutely. For the expression, I don't know. Because changes in expression are so dynamic and so variable that this is just very difficult to test in the field or to even know what would happen. In Beautiful talk. This is a follow-up to that question. Do you know the functional attributes of the differentially expressed genes? Because it, I'm sure these are not unique, just preference genes. They're probably pathways that are involved with lots of yeah. different things. Yeah. So that are probably maintained for other purposes, but you know, are uniquely expressed when they're evaluating these handsome males. So in the, of course, I didn't want to bore you with a table of like 190 genes, but I'm finding in the optic peak in particularly a lot of pathways that have been shown by your own work and in Medaca to be pathways that are involved in female preferences and social interactions. There's a lot of receptors, a lot of genes involved in cognition and in memory. Um, others are less clear to interpret. They're involved in gene expression, a lot of translation control, and particularly in the telencephalon, we find less genes, but they're all things that no one has mentioned in the context of social interactions before, so it's a little bit harder to interpret. Um, I had a question about sort of time scale. So how long does it take for a female to make a decision about who she wants to mate with? Um, and along with those lines, I, I sort of expect the decision process to be on a much quicker time scale than, than it's possible for sort of differential gene expression to change the behaviors that they're making for preferring different uh, mates. So mm -hmm. do, do you think your gene, your, your signals for your, your transcriptome analysis is, is more about plasticity rather than about them actually choosing between the mates? So for to answer the first part of your question, um, I only started working in guppies for my postdoc, so I don't know if this is a general thing, but in the lines we have in the lab, we chose 10 minutes because that's where most females made a decision to either walk away or mate uh, when we did all the preliminary work. In, in, in these lines, 10 minutes seem to be um, the time that they take to make a decision. But also, if you look at most work in the literature, it's they maintain behavioral exposure for at least 30 minutes. Um, and the thing is that when you do that, you find a lot of genes that are obviously involved in the comparison between mates, but you find a lot of genes. So we wanted to make our lives complicated, but try to identify those genes that are first becoming activated or turn, like turned on or off at 10 minutes when the female just like, you know, decides, makes a decision and everything else starts to happen. Um, and plus the, I think the second part of your question was referring to plasticity versus what like selected for like the change in preference phenotype. I think Considering the data and what I have right now, I can't really say. Obviously, within a preference line, and the response, can, like looking at the different males, is a plastic response. But um, I think where we're seeing evidence of something beyond plasticity is that the same behavioral comparison in lines with preference and with no preference leads to a completely different response. 
Um, and there's a lot more analysis that I did with the co-expression networks showing that not only it's a different, I mean, these are different genes that are located in different modules, different parts of the network that turn on and off different pathways. So it really looks like these two preference phenotypes involve a completely different response. And I think that's beyond just plasticity. This question may go beyond your research program, but you've probably thought about it. Is there any learning involved in the female response to males, either within the preference domain or the non-preference domain? Yeah, so females in guppies, and I think many other species, have been shown to prefer the more for the type of male that they're first exposed to. Um, so here in this experiment, we made sure we use virgin females that were raised in tanks uh, sadly by themselves and they weren't exposed to anything so you wouldn't bias our experiment. But there's a lot of work being done on how uh, preferences are very heavily influenced by learning. Which is interesting also that we're finding some genes within the, those preference genes that I found. There's three or four genes that are, have been shown to be involved in learning and long-term memory. Um, so it leads the way to maybe they're learning what they're seeing for future mating interactions. 